Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are as you've joined us this morning or this afternoon. Welcome to our third plenary session of the 27th Annual Japan Studies Association Conference. My name is Maggie Ivanova and I am GSA Vice President, currently affiliated with the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the East West Center. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Lonnie Carlisle, from whom I have been very fortunate to learn for the past 14 years. Lonnie is associate professor in Japanese, a political scientist whose expertise spans the East Asia region, region and the Asia Pacific. Um, and his home department is Asian studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Many of us know him as the director of the University Center for Japanese Studies, a position from which he rotated off earlier this academic year. Most recently, Lonnie has been the principal investigator for a three-year Japan Foundation-funded project for advancing intellectual exchanges with Japanese study centers in Southeast Asia. His work in publications spanned a wide area of inter interdisciplinary Japanese studies that include both uh, historical approaches, institutional approaches, and contemporary approaches. And his current research focuses on the political economic history of Okinawa and Hokkaido. And that might tell you why we invited him to be our plenary speaker for this third session. Speaking from experience here, I have to say that Lonnie has been one of JSA's most, most active collaborators and we're deeply grateful for all his expertise. He directed or co-directed workshops that took JSA members to Fukuoka, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Okinawa. Many of these teachers and scholars are in the audience today, no doubt. So please remember some of those wonderful experiences we had. I have to say personally, again, speaking from experience, that Lonnie knows the best ramen places in Fukuoka. Um, bringing us back to the serious uh, framework of our uh, conversation today, Lonnie will talk to us in his latest area of expertise on the colonization of the Saru River Valley in Hokkaido, presenting to us notes on a virtual landscape. Um, before I give the floor to Lonnie, just a couple of housekeeping notes. I will uh, monitor the chat. Um, so please send your questions as they come um, during Lonnie's presentation. I'll be on the watch to collect them. Without further ado, Lonnie, take it away. Very excited about your talk. Thank you, Maggie, for that wonderful introduction. I would also like to thank the JSA for organizing this event and for the Johnson County Community College for providing uh, technical services. Let me begin with some background disclosures and disclaimers. First off, a disclosure. What you are viewing here is not the original presentation that I made on January 8th uh, at the JSA conference. Uh, that was cut off midway for reasons that were entirely my fault. And what you're seeing is a re-recorded version. A bit of background. As Joe Overton explained in his opening remarks, Maggie and I were co-program directors for a Japan Foundation and Center for Global Partnership sponsored JSA University of Hawaii workshop uh, in Hokkaido that we were ultimately forced to give up on due to COVID. It was this planned workshop slash tour that was the impetus for my speaking to you today. We had um, planned an itinerary built around the three themes of Hokkaido geography, Ainu studies, and Hokkaido as a frontier. What I'm presenting today could be characterized as an effort to address those themes in a visually oriented manner that clearly doesn't duplicate, but does hopefully at least uh, serve as a step in that direction of actually seeing the sites in Hokkaido that we were hoping to see uh, that are relevant to these three themes. Third, a disclaimer, uh, I am an amateur and not a specialist on Hokkaido's geography, uh, indigenous studies, and Hokkaido history. What I'm presenting is information that I picked up on while preparing for the workshop tour. As such, the subtitle uh, of this talk is a literal description of what I'll be doing, essentially mapping my reading notes onto uh, primarily Google Earth maps. I would note that travel and other restrictions uh, caused by COVID also limited me 
to certain types of resource, specifically those I could get through the UHM library or over the internet. As a consequence of this, many of the sources are rather old. But having said that, I, I was actually pleased by the surprising amount of good location-specific information that I was able to, to garner from these, these older sources. This had a lot to do with the site that I chose to focus on. If you attended any of the Ainu-focused panels of the conference or watched prior JSA websites or webinars, excuse me, you've probably heard the village of Nibutani being mentioned. Nibutani, which is located in the town of Biratori, houses what is perhaps the largest and most well-known and well-studied Ainu community in Hokkaido. It is located in the Sadu River Valley, which is the focus of uh, this presentation. The downside of this, and this is another disclaimer, is that the experience of colonization in the Sadu River Valley is not a typical one. It is arguable that the very survival of this large Ainu community indicates that, at least in relative terms, colonization's impact was lesser there than in the rest of Hokkaido. So do please uh, keep that in mind as we go through this. Despite the lesser impact, I would note that colonization's impact was very real and visible. Okay, so as indicated in the title, we will be focusing on the Sadu River Valley. Where and what is the Sadu River Valley? Let us zoom in. Okay, as you can see in this map, Hokkaido is intersected by a number of mountain ranges. Uh, we will be concerned with the one in the foreground, the Hidaka Range. Here you can see that the Hidaka Range is associated uh, with a number of river valleys that flow from the, the watershed uh, peaks to the Pacific Ocean to the southeast. The region's climate is mild by Hokkaido standards. Among other things, it doesn't receive that much snow in the winter. And for this reason, it has traditionally been an area where deer and other game uh, come to stay for the winter. As for the Sadu River Valley itself, we will be focusing on the river system uh, depicted in the shaded area there. What you see there are the primary rivers uh, associated with that watershed. One is the Sadu River, um, which is, flows along the eastern and in the lower reaches, the central part of the watershed. And uh, the two primary tributaries, the Nukipira River, which flows down from the highest mountain in the Sadu Range, the Mount Poroshiri, and one of its tributaries, the Nuki, Nukibetsu River. I know this because I had to map these <laughs> rivers manually, but some 132 tributaries flow directly into the Sadu. And then there are dozens of others that uh, flow into the Nukipira and Nukibetsu rivers. So it's an extensive system. The Sadu itself is 65 miles long and uh, the area of the basin uh, is 520 square miles. So how are we going to approach this somewhat haphazard collection of geoprojected notes in a way that will add up to something uh, more than uh, a random sequence of, of noted facts? For this, I've taken inspiration from a recent application by the town of Biratori for its successful uh, application to become one of Japan's first important cultural landscapes. In this plan, the town uh, conceptualized what it was doing in using this, this graph that's presented here. And uh, I was kind of intrigued by it because it seemed to parallel somewhat uh, what I was doing and seemed like a good uh, way to do it. So what the town did was it conceived of its contemporary landscape as the product of a layering uh, process in which um, past periods basically stacked up on one another to create the contemporary landscape. And, and you see it, uh, the different layers that it, it conceived of listed there. We'll be focusing on the two that are circled, uh, specifically pre-existing 
Ainu cultural elements from the early modern, or if you prefer the Tokugawa period, and elements added in the modern period, that is since the late 19th century. However, having said that, I think uh, Biratori is uh, an inland town and it is severed from the coast of the Sada River Valley, from the mouth of the River Valley, by the fact that there, it, that uh, the mouth area is enclosed by a, a different administrative unit. So while this set of um, layers works for Biratori, if you're taking on the entire Sada River Valley, it's helpful to have one other element, one that you can insert between those two layers, and specifically elements added by Basho-centered mercantile operations that I will explain in a moment. But these take place largely along the coastline. For this presentation, we'll be focusing on the three, those three layers, the B and C of the Biratori application, and the third uh, Basho-centered operations that I, I just inserted. Okay, so let us move on to the first section of today's presentation, which corresponds to the sea layer in the Biratori landscape plan and focus on territoriality in early modern life in the Saru River Valley. This is a visualization of this layer in the Biratori plan. The term kotan, which you'll see here, refers to an Ainu village, a traditional Ainu village. And as you can see, the illustration shows, well, it might be a little hard to see, but the illustration shows three concentric circles, each with an assigned functionality, one for gathering, one for hunting, and a third realm, the largest realm, which is the realm of the gods or the kamui in Ainu. This is an illustration from a 1986 study by Kobayashi Kazuo, in which he maps the locations of late Tokugawa era Kotan in eastern Hokkaido. Here you can see how the Kotan of the Hidaka region were distributed along uh, the respective river valleys from the mouth of the river to about mid-level upstream. Izumi Seiichi, in a separate 1954 study, notes how this arrangement of kotan along the banks of rivers served as an identity marker. Thus, Ainu, who lived along the Sadu River, were identified as Sar Unkur, or people of the Sadu. Similarly, those who lived along what is now called the Mombetsu River were referred to as Mopet Unkur in Ainu, and those along the Atsubetsu River as At Pechi and Kerr, and those along the Mu River as the Mukat Pet and Kerr. It should be emphasized, however, that these river based identities did not imply a coherent political unit. The respective Kotan, which are marked by the dots, were essentially independent political and social units. And Izumi argues that the river based identity only uh, came into play when there was conflict. Uh, that involved the, with outside forces that involved the entire river valley. It wasn't until the 19th century that Japanese began to systematically explore the interior of Hokkaido. As a result, um, the information that we have on uh, pre-Meiji Ainu comes primarily from, well, comes from either Ainu folklore that's passed on or from the you know, 18, early 1800 explorations by Japanese explorers into the, the interior. Uh, anyway, this uh, map of the locations of the Saru River Valley Kotan um, is based on, on Wajin official. Wajin refers to a Japanese official who explored the upper reaches of the Saru River Valley in 1858. So the Kotan of the Saru River Valley as of 1858. Now, Barbara Lass, in her panel presentation, made a variety of, of fascinating points. One of these was how indigenous settlements throughout the North Pacific were associated areas associated with areas where you find salmon. And salmon were indeed a primary food source for the Ainu all across Hokkaido. The orange line is the extent of salmon runs in the Sado River Valley that I uh, 
duplicated based on the earlier Kobayashi paper. And uh, what is interesting about this is that Kobayashi's study confirms Lass's point about the association of, in the case of the Ainu, of the Ainu um, settlements with the extent of the salmon river runs. Okay, a further note, uh, this is a diagram taken from a 1972 study by Watanabe Hitoshi, in which he introduces the concept, the Ainu concept of the Iwar, I-W-O-A-R, which is a term used by Ainu to refer to the areas in which food and other resources needed to sustain Ainu life uh, were obtained. And it parallels the, the uh, illustration in the Biratori landscape plan. Somewhat like the native Hawaiian Ahupua'a, these were areas exclusive to a village that stretched from waters from which fish could be harvested through the hills and mountain to the mountain ridgelines. Uh, at the center of the Iwar is the river from which salmon and other fish were caught. Plants were cultivated on its riverbanks. Beyond these in the hills and in the mountains, animals were hunted and plant materials used for food and clothing were gathered. Here I attempted to map uh, the Iwar of the Saru River Valley onto a, a Google Earth map. Uh, based on a more stylized diagram um, in the Izumi paper. Again, in principle, each Iwar was used exclusively by the associated kota. Outsiders had to get special permission in order to enter and use the resources in a given Iwar. Also noteworthy is the fact that um, in some cases, Iwar were not contiguous. That is, there were uh, one section in one area near the Kotan and another section in, inside the Iwar of another Kotan. But these were, if anything, exceptional. And in the case of uh, the Sada River Valley, you find only two of these. In addition to salmon and other fish taken from the rivers, uh, oceanic marine resources were also used to sustain uh, Ainu life. And Izumi, discusses how there were some diff somewhat different arrangements in the coastal areas. So this is uh, taken directly from the Izumi article where he tries to map out territorial claims, if it, as it were, in the coastal areas of the Sadu River Valley. The yellow and green areas are the Iwar of the Piraka and Pitarpa Kotan, the two coastal Ainu, uh, Sadu River Valley Ainu Kotan. And what is noteworthy, I think, is the area with the, the diagonal lines that uh, marked off right next to the shoreline. And here you see an area where various inland kotan, that is, uh, those kotan that were located in the brown shaded areas and, and beyond, were allowed to set up fishing huts or chisekot during the appropriate seasons and engage in, in fishing. Noteworthy too, is how Ainu from the neighboring Mombetsu River Valley were also allowed to set up fishing huts in that zone. Thus, rather than an exclusive zone, zone, coastal areas had a more public character, so somewhat different from the arrangements inland. Adding all this together, um, I think one point that you can make is that uh, claims that Hokkaido, that was a terra nullius, that were made by the Japanese, the Meiji government. In fact, there was a pretty extensive and sophisticated property rights, rights regime um, associated with Ainu settlements. Okay, so let's move on to the second section, which is the one that I inserted into the diagram uh, in the landscape plan. And here all we, I will be talking about the Basho system. And you can think of the Basho system as the initial phase of Japanese, Japanese colonialism in, in Hokkaido. And uh, rather than kind of a, a territorial-based sovereign claim over uh, foreign lands, as I think is the sort of colonialism that we're most familiar with, this was a colonialism characterized by exclusive control over trade and other forms of e economic exchange in a quote, colonized area. As David Howell noted in his presentation, Ezo, as Hokkaido was called at the time, was divided into two areas, one controlled directly by the Matsumaya Daimyo, 
the Matsumaya domain that you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the map, and the other known as Ezo or Ezochi that was overseen by the, the Ainu. And as the map indicates, um, it's common to refer to a, a Western Ezochi and an Eastern Ezochi. In principle, Wajin or Japanese were not allowed to reside in Ezochi. On the one hand, the Matsumaya domain was organized basically like a typical Tokugawa uh, domain or Han, but with one key difference. Unlike other domains, its political econom economy was not built around the collection and distribution of rice. In place of overlordship over rice growing, Matsumaya retainers were assigned exclusive trading rights in a designated area known as Basho of Ezochi, where a trading post known as Unjoya or Kaisho was set up. Trading ships were sent out to the trading posts once or twice a year to exchange Japanese goods like sake or ironware for the hides, seafood products, and other products that the Ainu uh, provided in exchange. An important note uh, from a socioeconomic perspective is that the Ainu of a given basho were forbidden from obtaining Japanese goods from any other basho or to sell their products outside their assigned basho. If you think about it from an economic standpoint, what these rules did was to establish simultaneously a monopoly and a monopsony in favor of the Matsumaya and thus a favorable foundation on which to dominate and, and exploit this position at the expense of the Ainu. Until the 18th century, this trade was conducted by samurai retainers directly. However, after that, uh, the tendency, which became pretty much universal, was for the retainers, the samurai retainers of the Matsumaya domain, to delegate uh, these activities for a fee to merchants uh, who are known as ukeoinin. And it was these merchants or ukeoinin that would exercise uh, the trading rights on behalf of the, the retainers. As you might expect, uh, the merchants were much more adept at extracting profit from the basho than the samurai retainers were. They were also quite entrepreneurial. And over time, uh, they began to set up what you, what you might call factories for catching and processing fish and doing so in a systematic way uh, using Ainu labor. So what happens then is the Ainu shift from a position where they're simply trading goods to one where they're increasingly uh, serving as um, labor in these basho factories. One other point of note before I move on from the slide. On the right-hand side of the, uh, the slide, I've um, indicated the four different periods that are often referred to in, in Hokkaido history. Uh, and as you can see here, what you see is a, a shift back and forth from Matsumaya domain rule to Tokugawa Bakufu direct rule, back to Matsumaya domain rule, and back to Tokugawa uh, direct rule. And this was motivated by uh, incursions by Russians and other Western countries into Hokkaido. And um, during the Bakufu direct rule periods, the Bakufu felt compelled to take oversight over Ezochi away from the Matsumaya and uh, engage in, in direct oversight. But the essential essential aspects of the trading system, the basha system, uh, remained in place even during the, the uh, periods of Tokugawa direct rule. Okay, um, the conventional way of mapping the Ezo basho was to use lines demarcating the territory like the one uh, used in the slide. The slide depicts the Hidaka Coast basho in what I think is a way that better captures the reality of the basho and how these were uh, what is often referred to as a contact zone. As noted earlier, the Wajin presence was generally limited to the coastal areas uh, and the hinterland remained unexplored. The primary place, uh, physical place of uh, Wajin presence in the Basho system is noted by the flags. And these were the trading posts that were set up uh, to conduct Basho business. Until the 19th centuries, when the Japanese explorers started exploring the hinterland, there was not much, uh, there was very little Wajin presence inland. 
So these were areas, the Basho were areas, the trading posts were areas where Wajin would come in and encounter the, um, the Ainu who would descend from their uh, upriver uh, Kotan to uh, engage in trade and work for the, uh, the Wajin uh, associated with the trading posts who would, who would come to the trading posts. Uh, this is a re reproduction of a painting from the website of the Hokkaido University Library Northern Studies Collection. And what it does is depict the, the Sadu Basho. And one thing worth noting here is how the Basho is built around uh, the existing River Valley community, essentially constituting uh, relationships with a bundle of the existing River Valley community. I would also note that uh, the Basho was integrated into the existing social structure of the Ainu in another way. The primary intermediaries between the Wajin traders and the Ainu were the Kotan headmen, which were referred to the Japanese as the Ootona. This is another depiction of the Sarubasho trading post area, uh, one that more clearly illustrates the structures associated with it. The Kaisho, or the trading post, is a large building uh, located in the, uh, at the base of the hill uh, that you can see. And above it, you can see a shrine. So in the uh, trading post area, at least, you clearly see um, a Japanese stamp being um, present. And um, I would also note that by the 19th century, Activities associated with the Basho trading posts were systematically integrated into the annual life cycles of upstream Ainu in a pattern where from late spring to summer, Ainu would trade at the Kaisho and work in the Basho, Basho factories. In the fall, they would return. Uh, this was when the salmon began to run. They would return to their up, upriver Kotan where they would engage in fishing for salmon in the river and also to hunt in the Iwar. And the cycle would, be, would begin once again in late spring uh, when the Ainu would return to the, the Basho and uh, engage in activities there. To highlight this point, I've taken some diagrams, some illustrations from a 1986 article by Masatoshi Endo. Here he analyzed data from 1858 uh, to determine the extent to which uh, Ainu in the Hidaka area were engaged in seasonal migrations of the sort that I just described. Uh, that is moving from their home Kotan upriver to the trading post, post area downriver. So the dark area in the different pie charts um, lined up along the different river valleys show the percentage of households in which one or more members of a household engaged in the seasonal migration. And as you can see, it is pretty extensive. Uh, pretty much all uh, Kotan uh, households were uh, engaged in this sort of migration. Although the um, extent to which this is uh, the case varied from, from uh, river valley to river valley. And if anything, the, the extent of this migration uh, was less in the Sado River Valley than, than elsewhere. The chart on the right uh, is a series of population pyramids with the dark areas showing the age and gender of the people who uh, engaged in this seasonal migration uh, in 1858. And uh, as you can see, it's the prime working population, more males than females, uh, that did this. Um, although certainly uh, women were also involved in the seasonal trade. So you can think of, at least by the 19th century, the Basho system of one, uh, well, the two elements that I just described, the, the traditional Ainu uh, village lifestyle, the Kotan lifestyle and the war were systematically integrated uh, with the presence of the Wajin Basho that were set up on the coastline. Okay, moving forward, let's now talk about elements added in the modern period and specifically um, post-restoration developments in the Sado River Valley and uh, engage in some mapping of the processes that show geographically um, how the settler colonization that began to occur uh, unfolded. So the presentation will be revolve around three points in time separated by roughly two decades. 
uh, specifically 1873, which is about, which is five years after the restoration, 1897 and 1918. So one of the first things that the Japanese government did, the Meiji government did when it shifted to the uh, system focused in, in Hokkaido, which was now called Hokkaido rather than, than Ezo, to a system of, of settler colonization, was, as it did elsewhere in Japan, to create uh, villages as primary administrative units. This map shows the uh, territories uh, associated with the villages that were created at this time in the Saru River Valley. And um, a couple of, I think, interesting observations can be made. The names of the new villages uh, that were created are basically names, Japanese names of the Ainu Kotan that existed in the area. And secondly, the territories encompassed by the new village seem to be based on the old uh, Iwar boundaries. Not so much that each Iwar turned into a, a new village, but rather that uh, these were amalgamated uh, and the outer boundaries of, um, of the Iwar were Became to, came to serve as the outer boundaries of the different villages. This slide shows a series of maps uh, where the number of households in the Sada River Valley, the distribution of Ainu and Wajin, high households in the Sada River Valley at the three points in time that I mentioned. Note that the figures are incomplete due to the fact that the three villages near the mouth of the Sada River was amalgamated into a newly created village that consisted of six other villages outside the Sada River Valley. So uh, essentially what happens is I lost the, the figures for the Ainu uh, in the, the uh, coastal villages. And so what you have in the series of, of tables is the figures for uh, the Biratori only, that is the inland village of the valley. But nevertheless, it's possible to, to make a number of points. In terms of Biratori's population, you can see that it grew 4.5 fold over the 45 year period encompassed by the graphs, uh, with the rate of increase increasing dramatically during the, the second uh, phase, that is from 1897 to 1918. 85% of this increase was accounted for by an increase in the Wajin population. So what you're seeing is an increase in population uh, driven by Wajin settlement. In 1873, just, to, just five years after the restoration, you can see that Wajin settlers were concentrated in the, concentrated in the coastal areas of the Sada River's mouth, and the upper regions remained almost entirely uh, Ainu. In fact, uh, to be more specific, um, outside of the coastal villages, there were only five watching households um, upland. By 1897, however, you can clearly see Wajin inroads being made into the upland areas. But even so, uh, these areas main, remain largely Ainu dominated. The 1989, or I'm sorry, the 1918 figures, however, present a rather different picture. The Ainu dominance of the uppermost regions in particular has been reversed. Uh, and you see um, these areas becoming majority Wajin. So what were some of the factors that explain this particular um, trend line that's depicted in the, the three maps? Okay, so this is the 1873 map again. And what I've done is, used the Hidaka development history published in 1954 and basically pasted on onto it the uh, villages where the first Wajin settlers uh, settled in a given village during that period. So conspicuous here are the samurai who settled at the mouth of the Sada River. These were samurai from domains that had resisted the Meiji government and were given permission, if not encouraged, to resettle in Hokkaido, where they could constitute a Japanese presence that would counter Russian incursions, as well as keep them far away from the capital where they might stir up trouble. You do see, in the case of Biratori village, there were two households. Uh, initially, 
these were um, two agricultural agents who happened to settle in the village. But uh, one of them actually left the village after a year. And the other abandoned his job and became a merchant, um, trading sake and other Japanese household items uh, with the Ainu for fur and other goods. Um, somewhat reproducing the, the old system that, uh, of trade that was associated with the basho, I might note. Another way of trying to get at what things were like uh, during this time is to look at observations made by the British explorer Isabella Bird in her book, uh, Unbeaten Tracks in Japan, published in 1880, where she describes her journey uh, to Biratori from Hakodate in 1878. So she starts out, as indicated here, in the newly opened treaty port of Hakodate and proceeds to the, the port of Mori, where she takes a uh, ferry across from, from there to the village of Muroran, and then onward overland uh, by horse to Biratori. And uh, I won't read the passages, but I think it's useful to paraphrase, oh, and in one case read, uh, a passage, uh, since I think they provide nice um, descriptions and insight into the situation in the Hidaka region at this time. So first off, her Tomakomai entry observes how up to that point she had been um, treading a well-beaten path with a substantial number of Japanese travelers. She then notes, however, at Tamakomai, a fork in the road appears, and to her great delight, almost all of the Japanese travelers begin to head northward to the newly established city of Sapporo, leaving her to continue on a, quote, unbeaten path the rest of the way to uh, Biratori. She spends the night in Sarufto, at the base of the Saru River Valley, and she comments on the good work being done by the aforementioned settlers from Sendai, and uh, in particular, the nice uh, agriculture uh, farming that they were engaged in that she could very much relate to. Probably most interesting is her description of her journey by horseback from Sarufuto to the Ainu village of Biratori. And here are some, some excerpts from that, that description. We took three horses in a mounted Ainu guide and found the beaten track the whole way. It turns into forest at once on leaving Sarufuto and goes through forest the entire distance with an abundance of reedy grass higher than my hat on horseback along it. And as it is only 12 inches broad and much overgrown, the horses were constantly pushing through leafage soaking from a night's rain and I was soon wet up to my shoulders. The undergrowth is simply hideous growing from five to six feet high. The forest is dark, very silent, and threaded by this narrow path uh, made by the hunters in search of game. The main road sometimes plunges into deep bogs, at others is roughly corduroyed by roots of trees and frequently hangs over the edge of uh, abrupt and much worn declivities. So I think this description by Bird um, describes how 10 years after the restoration, um, the upper areas, at least the physical landscape, was largely unaffected by the restoration. Okay, so moving forward from 1873 to 1897, what I've done here is um, reproduce that uh, map that I showed earlier that showed uh, some um, Wajin incursions occurring in the upland areas. Uh, and again, we have the occupations of the first Wajin settlers. And it's interesting to see how, well, you do have farmers and ranchers coming in, but uh, the majority of the settlers remained um, people in occupations servicing or trading with the Ainu. So some change, but, you know, uh, arguably, certainly much more modest than what was going on in other parts of Hokkaido at the time with respect to Wajin settlement. This is a map of um, a relocation of Kotan that occurred in 1883 in the wake of an order to, for the Ainu to basically move out of their Kotan and take up agriculture. I think in most of the historical treatments, this push to get 
Ainu out of hunting and gathering uh, into agriculture is associated with the 1899 former Aborigines Protection Act. However, you can see that in the case of the Ainu River Valley, this occurred much earlier uh, in 1882. Uh, 17 years earlier. And the arrows point to the type of relocation that, that's more typical relocation that occurred as a result of this. And essentially what you see in the Khotan of Sarpa and Shunkot is the Khotan were located on the banks, close to the banks of the Saru River in areas um, where you have hills and basically uh, very close to the river itself. And this was ideally suited for fishing. Um, they were very convenient for fishing, however, not particularly well suited to, to agriculture. So what happened was um, these kotan were then moved across the river to uh, flatland areas where, uh, that were more suited to doing agriculture. So the relocation was relatively short uh, distance wise in the case of these villages, but there were some instances where uh, the relocations were much more extensive. So you can see how the villages of Porsar and Ninachimp had to move much farther. Uh, in the case of Ninachimp, you know, from a different river valley, in fact, to the Sadu River Valley, where they created a new village known as uh, Ninatsumi. That would end our discussion of developments up to 1897. And here we've moved on to the 1918 chart. Uh, and what I've done here is mapped out a number of other developments. So as we can see, um, Wajin presence um, extended, as I mentioned earlier, out into the upper reaches, and in particular, the uppermost region, uh, shift from being completely Ainu, or virtually completely Ainu, to becoming uh, Wajin dominated. And uh, one thing that was occurring was the opening of homestead plots by the Hokkaido government in the upper reaches of the, the Saida River Valley in the early 1900s. The legal framework for homesteading modeled after that in the United States was created in 1875. Um, and in the lower regions, there was some of this going on since that time. Uh, however, um, it wasn't until the turn of the century that these upper uh, plot areas were opened. And uh, this is when you begin to see a larger watching presence. Here I've used the same map to locate um, developments that would seem to be uh, create pull factors for watching to come in and um, move into these areas. So uh, the earliest one is a horse auction facility opened in the town of Biratori in 1899. And a lot of Wajin do come in and begin to raise horses, uh, which became very important uh, as Japan entered the uh, Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wards. So Hokkaido becomes a prime supplier of uh, the military's horses. Um, I might note that there are lots of stories in the Biratori history about Ainu not taking to agriculture after they were relocated and uh, on the becoming basic renting out their land to tenants and instead taking up uh, ranching. They preferred working in, in ranching and working with horses much more than, than doing agriculture in many cases. Uh, however, over time, as is common in indigenous histories, many of the Ainu uh, lose their businesses um, their horse raising businesses to Wajing, who are more adept at, at economic transactions. Another thing that occurs, and this explains um, partic in particular the presence of Wajing in, in the upper regions of the valley, is um, the opening up of a paper plant in Tomakomai in 1910, already anticipating uh, profits from lumbering. Uh, a lumber processing facility was opened at the mouth of the Saru River Valley and Saru Futo, um, but it was closed after a few years for a lack of business. Uh, however, once the uh, OG paper mill in Tomakomai is opened, it reopens and um, basically what it does is process logs that were sent down the Saru River to the mouth uh, and transport them and um, transported from there to the Tomakomai um, plant. 
And another thing that it ends up attracting uh, a lot of Wajin settlers is in 1914, uh, Cromore was discovered in the upper reaches of the valley. And uh, just two years later, a chrome mine was opened, Nito Chrome, uh, which hires a lot of, of uh, Wajin coming in. Also associated this was the extension of transportation facilities. Um, one of the earliest uh, transportation development efforts in Hokkaido was what was known as Ekite. And basically, uh, areas where horses were kept and travelers could um, stop there and get fresh horses and move them on to the next Ekite. Saru Futo uh, gets its Ekite as early as 1877. However, it's not until the turn of the century that the inland areas get theirs. And you see, um, you know, Ekite being set up all the way up to Usapu in the uh, upper regions, the parts of the valley. And, okay, with the development of uh, lumber, um, a rail line is, is, is extended first from Oji to Sarufuto, and then uh, from Sarufuto, a light rail line is created to Biratori. And this is how you end up uh, with the graphic that was created in the Biratori landscape plan. Uh, this is its um, graphic depiction of you know, what it sees. And what it sees is a different, uh, basically the E-War that it described in the earlier layer uh, as being replaced by facilities associated with uh, forestry and uh, the cutting, uh, processing of trees uh, with ranching. And um, finally, uh, agriculture, or actually first agriculture as indicated by the crop fields in the center, uh, bottom center of the illustration. Okay, um, let me then stop here. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, what I've presented is basically my research notes. And as such, I do not have any solid concluding points or larger arguments to present. Uh, what I do hope, however, is these do provide uh, some insight and some context for what I hope will be a deeper engagement in Hokkaido, with Hokkaido, if and when uh, the JSA is able to actually conduct its, its uh, planned workshop. Okay, so thank you very much. I guess Maggie has now arranged for me to, to take some questions that she has collected in the time between my original presentation and this one. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Lonnie, for this engaging, image-rich presentation. We received three questions and one comment, and I'll go, I'll follow the questions. I'll, I'll tell you the questions in the order in which we received them. So the first question came from Michelle Marion, who asks the following. Did the coastal communities have hunting rights inland since the inland communities had fishing rights on the coast? In essence, a reciprocity? Okay, well, I'm going by what Watanabe um, presented uh, in his 1952 paper. And um, yeah, the impression he gives is that no, uh, they didn't. And that the expectation was that they would uh, engage in hunting in their own Iwar. So in that sense, it wasn't reciprocal However, he also describes how um, there were negotiations. You could basically go to a, another kotan and ex ask to be allowed to gather resources of some kind, hunt or, or fish or, or gather plants, uh, whatever the case might be, in another Iwar. And what would happen then is that uh, there would be a discussion among the Ainu elders and uh, they would decide whether or not, um, you know, that, that request would be granted. So, I mean, Watanabe doesn't really say this, but uh, what, the, his, what he describes seems to suggest is that that would be how it would work. So the coastal village would then go to the, um, the inland village and say, hey, you know, we're, you know, we don't have, um, all that much game in our own e-war. So, uh, you know, and we, will you let us uh, hunt in, in your e-war? 
And um, he does document cases where uh, he doesn't necessarily distinguish between coastal and inland villages, but where this sort of thing happened. And in particular, um, he talks a lot about how, okay, the best, uh, there's a plant that was used to, to, cre to uh, create the poisons that were used in the arrow, arrows that, that the Ainu used to hunt game. Okay, so they would use poison-tipped arrows to, to hunt deer and, and other game. And the best and the most plentiful supply of uh, this plant was located in a particular village. So he talked, he mentions how, you know, quite a few other Khotan um, utilized, uh, were given permission to gather uh, that plant there. And this was just kind of a regular thing. Great, thank you, Lonnie. Moving on to the next question. Um, it's Lisa Brady who asks the following. She has a comment. She says, I have a comment instead of a question, but would be eager to hear your response, Lonnie, if you feel inclined. I love maps and really enjoy the use of them in this presentation. One thing that struck me is how clearly erasure by appropriation can be seen in these maps. That is how Japanese structures appropriated existing Ainu structures to shift power from the Ainu to the mercantilist, to, to the merchants and the settler colonists. So she, I guess she's inviting a comment if you would like to do so. Yes, I agree. In fact, that was one of the points I was trying to, to make in, in, in an earlier slide. Yeah, so, and I think, yeah, that she kind of hints at a, a larger point that um, the contemporary landscape, especially administrative boundaries and what have you. I mean, I, I think I, I kind of made a case for this in the case of the Sider River Valley, but I think if you went throughout um, Hokkaido, uh, you'd see the same thing. Whereas as Ainu names, uh, Ainu demarcations, uh, and so on and so forth, provide the foundation upon which the contemporary administrative structure of Hokkaido uh, is found is built. Okay, so the um, you know for instance the uh, conversion of of Ainu Kotan names into um, place names, uh, you know in Japanese place names uh, to which you know char characters are attached. I mean you find that all over Hokkaido, um, virtually any. Uh, town in Hokkaido that, um, uh, you know, is something Betsu, right, uh, was um, named after the, the river, the Ainu name for the river uh, that was located there. Does that answer the question? In my <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a comment, so yeah. um, I'm sure yeah. Lisa will get in touch with us if she has a follow-up question. Yeah, so I very much agree. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Lisa. Micheline Sung, actually, in response to your descriptions of Isabella Bird's travels, uh, the unbeaten tracks in Japan, she actually provided the uh, Project Gutenberg link, which I'm, I'm actually making available here. I'm pasting it on the slide. So those uh, of our participants who are interested in reading uh, Isabella Bird's comments can do so on their own. And this brings me to the last question, the third question. I comment, kind of a, Absolutely, yes. uh, um, a note. Um, yeah, Isabella Bird is, you know, uh, an English woman at the uh, height of social Darwinism, right? Um, so if you're going to read it, be prepared uh, to encounter lots of you know, extremely cringeworthy expressions um, and attitudes not just from her, but also from the, the Wajian that she, she uh, encounters. Uh, yeah, that's a good warning and we'll take it on board. Um, and this brings us to the fourth uh, comment slash question. Uh, it seems like Barbara Lass and you are entering a dialogue here. So this is what Barbara says. My understanding is that the revocation of the Ainu did not involve the establishment of official reservations as it was the case with many Native Americans. Do you have any ideas as to why? Did it have to do with availability of land? Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um, why no reservations? Well, I think maybe one thing uh, that was involved is, 
Well, I get the sense that, um, you know, the Japanese had for, in, in, in Hokkaido, had for centuries by that time been engaged in, well, had been, had, had um, used Ainu labor. So I think, um, you know, one point of contrast might be that, um, you know, the use of Ainu labor. Uh, and they were, you know, especially in the early part of, of the post-restoration period, they were very much um, reliant on Ainu workers. You even see this in the, the um, in, in Bird's book, where she described, oh, you know, there was an Ainu who we hired as a guy. There was another one at the, the river crossing that helped us get across. And, you know, um, you encounter Ainu working for the Japanese um, throughout her, her memoir. So uh, I think that's certainly one reason. I think another, yeah, that's probably it. And yeah, I don't know how to, how, if this is actually true, but, you know, reading these, these, well, um, no, it's probably true for, yeah, I, I don't know how, the, if this is a valid comparison, but certainly, or, or a, a factor, but there was, you know, a fair amount of intermarriage where Japanese men would take an uh, Ainu wife or uh, Japanese orphans would be adopted into Ainu households. Uh, and so, yeah, there wasn't quite the same sort of physical separation uh, as well as even, you know, uh, kinship separation, if you will, between um, the Ainu and the Wajin, as maybe this is the best way to put it, as is commonly uh, understood in the case of, of North America. Um, although uh, I think maybe, I mean, there's a fair amount of that going on, I know for sure, in, in the Americas as well. So, yeah. Um, and I don't get the sense that, you know, there ever was an effort or, you know, a plan proposed by the Japanese government to actually put Ainu on reservations. Um, and um, I think it was in a, yeah, David Howell sort of talks about this. Um, but the I idea was more to make, turn the Ainu into Japanese and making them good Japanese nationals. Uh, that's the government, tends to be the Japanese government's attitude. Um, and this is separate from um, the sort of discrimination at the grassroots level that Ainu constantly suffered uh, from, from Wajin. Um, one more quick comment. Uh, I was originally going to include this in a slide in my presentation, but it simply got a little too complicated. Um, but, okay, in the early 1900s, uh, the Hokkaido government adopts a policy of trying to separate Ainu from Wajin students in school, in schools. Uh, so, one, of, one pillar of this was building separate schools, one for Wajin, one specifically for Ainu, and, uh, you know, presumably the other schools would be uh, Wajin schools. And a number of uh, Ainu schools were, were built uh, or, or created. One was in Nibutani, uh, another was further upriver, with the idea, this was a rationale um, that Ainu needed extra help. Uh, this was a way of protecting the Ainu by giving them uh, a different sort of, of education. Um, so on the one hand, you know, this reminds one a lot of Jim, the Jim Crow South, right? Uh, but the, at the same time, the rationale, I think, is, is, is somewhat different. Um, although I defer to people who have actually studied this, uh, Jim, the Jim Crow South, to, to confirm or, or uh, correct me on this. Um, but what was also interesting in the, the articles that I read was how much trouble um, the government had in implementing these policies. Um, so, you know, they would get, you know, uh, lower ranking officials would, would contact the, the Hokkaido government and say, okay, now, how am I supposed to determine whether one is an Ainu and deserving of protection uh, and, you know, which, who is not? 
Um, you know, and they go think through things like, well, is a watching adopted in an Ainu family uh, an Ainu or, um, you know, as an Ainu adopted or that who marries into or is is of mixed race to be considered, you know, the object of protection. And, and um, if you look at the statistics for the Sada River Valley, there were a couple of schools that tended to be Ainu dominated, but every school, even the, the officially Ainu only schools were mixed. Um, you had both Wajin and, and Ainu students. So yeah, that policy never quite got off the ground and by the 1920s, they decided to abandon it. Mm. Thank you, Lonnie, for these uh, really nuanced and detailed answers. And I take the opportunity to wrap up this panel and to thank Lonnie on JSA's behalf, on behalf of all participants for sharing his time and expertise with us. And many thanks to all of you joining us for this third and final JSA plenary. Even if you're accessing the recording for the first time, um, we see this as just part of an ongoing conversation. And we look forward to seeing you at future JSA events. I'm sure we'll have other opportunities to talk with you about uh, Hokkaido and indigenous communities there and the diversity that Japan is slowly embracing. Thank you, Lonnie, very much. And we look forward to seeing you again at future events. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Maggie.